Nehemiah 3, 26 is where we'll be at tonight. We're going through Nehemiah's Jerusalem, um, the gates of Jerusalem, rather. And we are tonight at the water gate. At the water gate. Nehemiah 3, 26. Everybody there? Amen. Yeah. It says, Moreover, the Nethanims dwelt at Ophel unto the place over against the water gate towards the east and the tower that lieth out. That's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the water gate. The water gate itself, and you can look it on your map, is located southeast of the temple, just above and close to the fountain gate. Just, just above the fountain gate is where we'll be at, is the water gate. The water gate speaks spiritually to the Christian walk as a picture of the Word of God and how it works in our lives. It's no accident that the fountain gate is, is so close to the water gate. The fountain gate was what we went through last week. They both work together in your Christian life and in your journey. The fountain gate, which is the spirit, helps to guide us through the water gate, which is a representation of the word of God. Both of them work synonymous together. We talked about this last week when we talked about the fountain gate, that you've got to have the spirit of God. You've got to have him in understanding the word of God uh, as far as growing in your Christian walk. You can't do it without it. You can't walk that Christian walk. You can't do these things without the Spirit of God indwelling inside of you. It's not going to happen. Amen? Amen? So, this week we're going through the water gate. Now, you're going to hear a phrase tonight. It's called being washed by the word. What would that mean? What does being washed by the word mean? 2 Timothy says this. 2 Timothy 3, to be exact. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Being washed in the word is taking care of every one of those. If you can only imagine like a, a dirty windshield and you've got a windshield wiper, you ever notice that when you, if it's just drizzling and you haven't really turned your wipers on yet, it's just kind of getting really hard to see. And all of a sudden you turn your wipers on and it's like a whole new life. It just kind of washes it. It's, it's, it's the same windshield that it was yesterday before it rained, but today it seems so much clearer because you've got to see how dirty it was to begin with. And now once it wipes all those spots off, look how clear it looks. That's the washing of the word. And it's, it's profitable for doctrine, for truth, for reproof, for correction, for in, in, in instruction in righteousness. That's what this word is for. And that's what we're talking about tonight is that, is that uh, the word of God, it's the washing at the water gate. In the Old Testament, water is seen as a spirit lots of times. Uh, the fountain flows it, and the water gate washes it. Last week was in the fountain gate. This week we're in the water gate. As it comes out of the fountain, the water gate is what washes it away. Listen to this, Ephesians 5, 26. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it, being the church, with the washing of the water by the word. Amen. This speaks of the church that Jesus gave himself for in, 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 in the book of Ephesians. He was talking about that. Talking about the washing of the water by the word. Amen. Let me give you another one. John 15, 3 says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How can a word, how can a speaking of a word cleanse you? Well, first of all, you, you, it's divine. It's a living word. And second of all, when Jesus cleanses by speaking the word, it has a property of being able to wash away that dirty windshield. Does that make sense? It brings to light things that were in the dark before. Um, when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, that's a type of washing to someone that didn't know. Okay? When he talks about in the, in the word about uh, 
they came to Peter after Peter's preaching and wanted to know what must we do to be saved. And Peter tells them, believe, repent, and be baptized. When he explains all that, that's a washing of a word because it's taking it, it's, 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 not, it's not just reproving, but it's, it's profitable for the truth. It's taking instruction in righteousness. It's washing away those things that weren't right. The things that we thought were okay in our lives, when we read what God thinks about it, it washes away what we thought about it. Amen? That's a simple way to look at it. Because it's the truth of God that washes those things away. Amen? Listen to what he says in the Psalms 119.9. He says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. How do you, how do you, how do you uh, cleanse your way? Well, you let him cleanse it. How did he cleanse it? He spoke it. How do we know that? Because he wrote it. And guess what? We can read it and understand it. And we follow it. We follow the word. Amen. That's, the, that's the, the, the spiritual side that we're talking about tonight. What we want to talk about is the word itself at this gate. You can depend on God's word. Can I tell you that? Amen. One of the most predominant things, I mean, there's a lot of things that goes on in a person's salvation, but what got me even before I got saved was the way the word came to me. And it cleansed me of all my thought process. It didn't, it didn't save me. Jesus saved me by his blood. But there was a lot of things in my thought process about God's word that I didn't really understand. And it was, I had a different thought about it. I had a different understanding for it because I was unlearned. I didn't understand it. But the word made itself known to me when I did get saved. There was a lot of things that had to be cleaned up in my life as far as my doctrine, my, my, my way of understanding scriptures. There's a lot of things that got cleaned up and still does today. I don't know how long you've been saved, but I don't know that you ever get to the point where you still don't get changed by the word. Does that make sense? I don't know that you still come. You never get to the point where you're perfected. that says, oh, I already know all that. It, I don't think I've never met anybody. I've met preachers that are 80 years old and they're still finding things. I remember preaching one time, and I think it was here, uh, a preacher came in. He'd been preaching longer than I'd been breathing. And uh, got done that day, and, and he testified that I've never, he said, I've never heard it preach like that. And he wouldn't rebuke it. He couldn't rebuke it. I read it right from the Word. But he, what he was saying was he learned from what was read again. So I don't think you ever stop learning from what God's put in his Word. I think if you do, um, you might want to check yourself because something's going awry. But there's always, first of all, there's always room for improvement, right? There's always a cleansing, always cleaning out. But there's always stuff that needs to be washed away. And the thing about it is you can depend on the word to do that. One of the things that I loved, uh, I remember when I first got saved, I just was so intrigued by how it came to life. The, the word itself, to read the things of God, to read John 3, 16 that I have seen my whole life different places and could probably have told you half of it back then, even as a lost man, but never understood it. It came to life for me once it came life in me. Once the word uh, was true to me and understood it, I could depend on it. I can always depend on the word to do what it said it was going to do. One of my favorite scriptures, he says, I'll turn not one man away that comes unto me. Jesus held his word, and his word told me that, and I believed it. And you know what? I can depend on that. I can depend on that. He says, I'll sit closer to you than a, than a brother. He always has. He's never forsaken, never left. He's not done it. You can always depend on God's word. We're always going around this world when we find ourselves in a trial or a, or a, a, a low spot in the valley in our life. And we're starting to try to pull things out of the world to get us through. Well, that's not going to help you because that's only a quick fix. I heard someone talk about today, they were witnessing to some people, and it was a podcast, and they were just talking about witnessing to people. And he said, I really had to change my mindset from the way I was brung up because it used to be I would evangelize to someone and say, you know, you don't, you don't know real peace 
until you know Jesus. You don't know peace until you know Jesus. You don't have peace in your life until you get Jesus. And I know where he's going, and he knew it too. But he said, I had to understand something. That was wrong of me to say because people find peace in the world, but it's not lasting. You could win the lottery. You'll probably be pretty peaceful for a little bit till it all runs out. You, you, may, um, you may have cancer and get into remission. And you say, well, now I've got peace. You're still going to die. It may not be that cancer. There's always something that's going to be in here that you could try to reach for. And I remember him saying that I had to change back. If you really want true lasting peace, you go to Jesus. Because the world has its ideas of things, too. You see, that's how the, the devil works, right? He's a manipulator, and he likes to mirror what God's doing, but it never is the same. We think it is until we get it. So there's always things in this world that we, we think we can depend on until they're gone. But God's word is always there, always dependable, and you can always use it. Amen? Amen. And it shall never go out void. The word Never goes out void. I love it. You can preach from this thing every day till Sunday. Whatever comes out of this book will come to pass or has come to pass. You can depend on it and it doesn't go out void. His word does not go out void. What God said, you can depend on. It doesn't go for nothing. And that's why I always say, we can read the word in every line in the context of what God has written. Why? Because he said it for a reason, not void. God doesn't just say things to fill pages up. 66 books worth. He didn't just say it just to say it. He didn't just get people to, he didn't just to have the Holy Spirit to, to uh, pen through man just certain things just because he wanted to fill a book up. He did it because it didn't go out void and it was always where it needed to be. Always the truth, always dependable, always there. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> Nehemiah 3.26 is what we had read earlier. I want you to notice something. It says the water gate itself didn't need repairing. I want you to see this. It says, moreover, the Nethanims, which these are temple servants, okay? Uh, it's funny we're going through this. Today I heard a Bible teaching today, and somebody called in and said, what are the Nethanims in Nehemiah? And I said, ooh, i got to listen, because we're in Nehemiah. He said, what are the Nethanims? Well, you give a big, long speech, I won't give it to you, but Nethanims were basically common people that were set aside by God, given to the priest for servanthood. <laughs> what did they do? They, they cut wood for the fires, they brought waters in, so well, that's not very spiritual. No, but they were a servant of God for the priest. They meant a lot. So when you see that name Nethanims, and they're in the Old Testament, they were temple servants. That was their job. Amen. So, moreover, the Nethanims dwelt in Ophel unto the place over against the water gate. And I got the reading on this. That doesn't mean that necessarily it was the water gate itself. It was over against the water gate is where this was at. This is where they were going. Towards the east, towards the tower that lies outward. Okay? Lies outward towards the, the, the field. Okay? Now, what is so good is, good is that the water gate itself didn't need repairing like the other gates. Out by the water gate. The water gate itself is the picture of the word of God. You don't need to repair this. It don't need changing. It don't need fixing. It don't need added to, and it don't need taken away. That's right. The Word of God has always stood. I thought this was awesome to think about. He says, now these Nephilims, Neth they're going to go over and fix this place outside over towards the water gate. Go towards the tower from that way over, and I read about that. It wasn't necessarily the water gate itself, but it was out near it. You think, well, you're just playing a play on words. Well, listen to what I said. The water gate itself didn't need to be repaired because it don't get torn down. Guess what? Neither does the Word of God. The Word of God stands where everything else will fall. The grass withers, right? The flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever. Amen. Right? 
That's awesome. I thought that was so awesome. This is to say the word of God will stand forever, not ever needing repaired, changed, updated, or modified. And this is exactly what men try to do today. They have tried to take the word of God and they've modified it. They try to update it. They try to change it. And there's people out there that say, well, there's so many things wrong in it, we need to repair it. And this is men. And this is what we've tried to do. And we wonder why things have gotten such a mess in the world. Because we've taken the truth of God that does not change and we made it into a God that changes and we make him into what we want. Now we worship and read a book, or we worship a God and then read a book that is made up by man. Now, that makes no sense because you've got sinful man, lost man, fallen natured man, Following, following after his ideas. Blind leads the blind, they both end up in the ditch. That's why you've got to have what God has said, what God's put down, and worship an unchanging God, Jehovah God, amen? And that's, that's what we're talking about when it comes to the word of God. It's not going nowhere. The tower which is to proclaim it, get this, in that verse 26 it says, and the tower that lies outwardly. All that area where the tower was, all that stuff, that needed to be repaired. The tower which is to proclaim it and watch may need repair now and then. But the word is always perfect. You know who's the tower? You know who set us up on a tower? If you read the Old Testament, I think it was in Ezra, it said, that I, I've lived, I, put you a, I put you a watchman on a tower. Sometimes we need a little repair. Sometimes we need to be rebuked and changed and modified because of our thinking, which I'm okay with because we need that. But the Word of God does not. It doesn't get changed, and it doesn't get modified, and it doesn't need added to, and it doesn't need to be taken away. Sometimes I wonder if they've ever read the Scripture in the book of Revelation, in the very last chapter, when it tells us not to add to or take away, I wonder if anybody really thinks about that when they put their own thoughts in it. I'm going to just bet they probably just took that part out. Because I, when I read that, it means don't be trying to put your idea that way. Don't, don't because you don't like what it says in John 3.16, don't skip to John 3, 18 and 19 or something like that. Don't mess around with what I put in front of you. It is what it is, you see. But because we are those ones that need repairing and stuff, it needs to be done. Nine times out of ten, what's ended up doing it is the word is what gets us washed and cleaned and prepared away, right? You know, you said something. If the ones that are wanting to add to or take away from Scripture, if they ever think about that, it's lack of faith is why they're even in, in that situation. Yeah. They want to do that. It's lack yeah. of belief mm -hmm. right there. So, Well, it, and yeah, it's actually a lack of wanting authority because if God has said, and I trust God with my life and anything he wants, I've had faith and trust in God, that he is my authority. Okay? I have no authority but what God is, right? That's right. He's Amen. all authority. Yeah. So when I want to say, well, I don't know about that, and I don't think they meant that, and I don't think God says this, and I've, I've been told before, yeah, I believe in God, but I don't believe you have to be born again. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you just read, but I read it, that you must be born again. So if that's the case, you have a problem with authority. Because if God has said it, and you say he didn't, you have a problem with authority. I, I don't, uh, and I'm not claiming anything on anybody's salvation, but sure. if you doubt the word of God, are you really saved? I mean, that would have to be a question that you would have to answer. Yourself. Well, I'll tell you this. I, like you said, I can't be an authority on someone's salvation, other than the fact of what God has given us to know. Yeah. But I will say this. If you doubt one part, what keeps you from doubting the others? Right. If I doubt that they crossed over the Red Sea, if I doubt that, if I doubt they were brung, 
bread and manna from heaven and he fed them. If I doubt that happened, what makes me from not doubting I must be born again and it must be by the blood of Jesus? If I doubt these things of wherever, what keeps me from doubting the scriptures that gives me the encouragement to understand I'm born again? Right. Amen. Why would I not doubt when he said, I won't turn you away? Why wouldn't I doubt that and say he probably will? You see? If you take out one, you take them all. You can't have the way you want it. Because that's what we're doing when we do that to the Word of God. When we come to the Word of God and say, well, I just, I, I just don't agree with that. It's not about you. It doesn't matter. This world is not going to stop turning because Troy says, I don't agree with that scripture. Matter of fact, it's going to keep on going whether I'm in it or not. You see. What we have to understand, and there, there we go again with the authority problem, because now I'm, I'm the master of all, okay? God, yeah, I believe in him, but I don't think you have to do this. Now, who's correct here? When, when I heard that from a lady, I, 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 you know, I, I know there's a heaven, I believe there's a hell, and I know there's God, but I don't believe you have to be born again. Um, that's, a, that's a wow. It tripped me up for a minute. But then I matured and understood a little bit more that uh, if you can say that, um, then the rest of the book is no good to you too. So that's why I say, don't add, don't take out. You either believe it or you don't. If you don't believe this part, but you believe that part, that part ain't no good either. That's right. That's the way that it goes. Because um, then it makes it flawed then. Sure. I mean, there, there is no flaw, and, and, and there is people, there is a belief system out here that says the Bible is fallible. It's, it's, not, it's not completely perfect. It's, it's not. And uh, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. If you, now, when it comes to reading in context, if you want to read it out of context, we can make a mess of it all day long. But if you want to read it in the context and it takes the time to do that, you'll see that it's right where it needs to be. Amen. It's, it's perfect. It's where it needs to be. <clears throat> All right. Now, Nehemiah 8. This is good. I'm talking about the water gate. So the scriptures that we read earlier in chapter 3 isn't the only place the water gate is mentioned. Does anybody else know about the other scripture that talks about it? This is one of my favorites in the Old Testament. I've preached this many times, taught it many times, read it many times. I love it. Because this, to me, okay, to me, this is like one of your first church settings. Okay? Uh, one of your congregational church settings with a preacher and everybody there and, and the people are just wanting it. Okay? They want the word, right? It's in Nehemiah chapter 8. Let's, let's just read a little bit. Now keep in mind, we're talking about the water gate, the word itself, right? It says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe, okay, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Let's stop right there. This is awesome. The people gathered together themselves as one man. That means they were there for the same purpose. Yeah. Boy, this could be preached. And it probably has. But when people come together, when God's people come to gather together, they should be exactly as these people of Nehemiah's day were. The people gathered themselves together as one man into the street. One man, meaning one purpose, one mindset. Amen? If people in the church, I don't care if you got 500, 100, or 15, if they came with the same purpose was to worship and hear from God, if they came on that same purpose, the purpose would happen. But what happens is, and inevitably, if you've got two people that come to service, neither one's in the same place. you got 15, 20, 500, 5, 100, whatever it is, it seems like everybody's 
emotionally here, emotionally there. One of them's thinking about what they're going to have for lunch. The other one's thinking, man, I hope this kid sits still. Man, they're going to run us out of here. The other one is brokenhearted because whatever's happened. One is lost as a goose in a hailstorm and don't care. The other one is clenching the pew so hard they can't stand it. The other one's in the back because they got a burden for them. I mean, everybody's got something going on, but these understood this. They understood it together as one man, one mindset, one thought, one purpose. One purpose when they gathered. And they gathered in the street, which was before the water gate. So wherever you're at on your map, you can see it at that water gate. That's where they're at. Okay? And they spake to Ezra the scribe. Okay? He's a biblical scholar now. To bring the book of the law of Moses. Old Testament. Pentateuch, right? Which the Lord had commanded to Israel. All right. Now, here's the defining moment. They wanted it. Yeah. Now, we've already established they were on the same mind, same accord, same purpose wanting, right? So whatever we're getting ready to say, they all wanted it, right? What did they want? They brought the book to Ezra. They all wanted the truth. Can I tell you, I don't care how many people is in your church service, not everybody is in there for the truth. And if you can say that all day long, you're fooling yourself. Because I promise you, I don't care how many saints you've got sitting there, not everybody's in there wanting the truth. I didn't say they didn't believe it was the truth. They don't want the truth a lot of times. Be a preacher for a day on a Sunday, and you'll find out they don't always want the truth. But the truth will set you free. And that's what the preacher has been convicted and convinced it will happen. And that's why he has to do that if he's a God called man. They wanted it. You know why they wanted it? Because they never had it. They've done it their way. And you know when you do it your way long enough, you figure out something's got to give. You know, if you go 30 years and you just turned on God, you didn't want to do nothing he said, and you don't care what about what he said, what he commanded, you're going to do it your way, but you've always had turmoil and strife and death and sickness and all that stuff. Everything's going on in your life and you can't figure out what's going on. Eventually, you've got to say there's a common denominator in this, and it's me. I'm doing it like I want. They didn't. They said, give us the book. They bring the book of the law of Moses, okay? Verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, now catch this, both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding. What's that mean? If you understand when somebody says close the door, there's a door behind you, close it, you understood what they said, right? That's what he's talking about. Men, women, whether it be a child or not, whatever of understanding. That's the way I take that. Anybody with understanding, if you can understand the words that's going to be spoken, they were there. And, and, they, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month, I'm not going to get into that, but from what I can remember, that was like the, the new year of them. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Church service. He, he read it. He read it. In there. In it. Before the street. That was before the water gate. From morning until midday. I don't hear anybody. He didn't have to stop and say. Okay we've come too far. Oh wait a minute. Clock said that. He read it. He was in it. That long. Before the men and the women and those that could understand. He makes another uh, uh, comment about that. If you understood, then you weren't, you weren't uh, without excuse. Amen. That's what I take from that. These men, these women, those that can understand. Because if you can understand it, you can't walk out of this place that the truth was spoken and say you didn't hear it. You know how many people want to do that? You know how many people, you know how many why people usually turn down the gospel being spoke to them because they know if they hear it, they have to deal with it. You say, even the lost, even the lost. Even when I was lost, 
I knew that if you told me the truth on something and I don't like it, it's off of them, it's on me. I still got, to, I don't have to do it, but I still got to live with that consequence. You see what I'm saying? I was smart enough to know that and everybody else is too. Before the men and the women that, that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Nobody was sleeping. Nobody was talking. Nobody was on the phone. Nobody was chasing a kid. Nobody. They were all attentive unto the book of the law. The man was preaching the book. And all the ears were attentive to what was said. Because you remember, they are the ones that brought it to him and said, tell us. Right? I don't know, because today, here's the thing. We'll have a church and we'll have we'll, we'll vote a pastor in. You'd be here every Sunday, you know, you know, rain or shine, do this, do that, do it. We want you to bring the word. And then the first Sunday comes. No, it's not usually the first. Usually like the first month. Second month it comes with the work. First month it was a honeymoon stage. And then the honeymoon stage is over. And the second month comes in and he really gets on them. They don't listen no more. Because they don't like what they heard. It always behooves me to think, man, what happened there? Because they, they, they weren't attentive anymore to what was being said. They didn't care what was being said anymore. They did it one time. Because they brought him in and said, here, preach to us. We need a preacher. You know how many churches jump into that? We want a preacher. We want a preacher. Instead of God sending the preacher, they pick one and say, now God bless it. Now wait a minute. If you want the preacher in there, you're going to have to be attentive when he brings the word, right? This is what they were doing. They were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood up upon a pulpit of wood. Look at it. A raised spot. People can see, they can see him, right? Which they had made for the purpose. Now we know also they didn't just bring the book. They were doing some preparing before they brought the book. Do you get this? There was something inside of them that says, we got to have this. We want him up. Bring him, they built that. Then they brought him the book. So there was some preparedness going on even before they got the word, right? Do you know there's some preparedness that's got to go on before we come in? There's some things we've got to do before we come into the place of worship. We need to be getting ready. We need to be positioning ourselves. We need to understand that we want this to be attentive to this. And we've already set everything in play to today. I want that. You see, I love this. These people had church. And they weren't just doing church, they were having it. You see, there's a difference there. Yeah. There's a difference between doing and having it. We can do anything. But do you really have it? You see, that's the difference. And they made it for the purpose. And beside him stood Manitiah and Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkah, Messiah, and on his right hand, and on his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Milcah, and Hashem, and Hashbadan, and Zechariah, and Meshulam. Now, who's all these men? I don't know. But I did look them up. Um, there's no specific that says, or the definite that says, most of them believe that these were priests that were beside Ezra. Okay? Most people believe that these were priests. That there's nothing that's documented that says this. I mean, and I'm sure there's people smarter than me that's looked up each name and this and that. But there's nothing that can, that can definitely say rock hard that says, hey, this is what they were. No. They were more than likely just priests at the temple. Okay? And they were up there with him. So you can imagine the preacher standing on this side and then on that side. And all these men were standing for the purpose of giving the people the word. It's a church service. Right? It's a church service. This is awesome, man. I'm loving this thing. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people. 
awesome. You know, we get we take it for granted that we just get up here and go poop. But you know, I mean, I'm not looking for fireworks or nothing. I'm not, I mean, you know, and I'm looking for everybody just to go, go crazy. But when, when someone opens up a, a holy Bible, to me, that's always just, and it always has been, something very uh, noteworthy. When you open up your word, we do it now nonchalant because we just, and I do it too. Because I'm so used to open it and read and study and preach and study and write and teach and do it. And just do it. You just, but you know, there's something about opening in life. It, it, you, you think about this. We take all these away in about 20 years and you ain't never seen one. And then someone has one. Can you imagine? Oh. Well, that's where these people are coming from. Because the, these they people did. didn't have Bibles in their home. No, and they didn't have the law to go by that way. From what I was reading today in a commentary, that these people, it wasn't just that they weren't doing the things, they never even knew what to do. This generation didn't even know what to do, so they had never had the open to say, hey, thus says the Lord. No, they didn't have it. But they knew it was there, what God had said to do. And they knew the book was found, and they like, tell us. Yeah. You see? There's a need when things aren't there. Especially when things get haywire in your life and you finally get to the point where you're like, I, I give. I give, God. Just, just you. Just you. That's when things can happen. But these people here, this is, this is awesome. Ezra opened the night. He's up on a stage, right? He's behind a pulpit. Everybody's looking. You can only imagine you can hear the pin drop, right? And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people. In other words, he was high up on that stage enough, everybody watched him go, can you imagine? I mean, maybe I'm just a nerd, but I can't imagine just opening that book amongst the people, God's word. You know? I mean, I don't know. I guess I just get butterflies over. Just to think about what happens when you open that book. There's something going to happen here. For he was above all the people, not, not, not statue, but, but just physically. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. You see? It's a, it's almost like whew, we're in the presence of something holy. Remove thy shoes, for the ground you stand is holy ground. You see? I know we did this at the church we came from, but you remember, anytime the preaching was supposed to start, they read the scripture. Everybody stood. Remember that? You ever been to church to do that? Yeah. When I was growing up, we never did that. I started passing over and they stand up and I was like, what are we doing? And I, I, I found it. First of all, it does, you have to do it. This ain't got nothing to do with my salvation, okay? This is, you do, you don't, you, hey, I think it's great. One, two, fine. But these people stood up when he opened the book, which give it reference to God's word itself, amen? And God's word itself, amen. Here's the problem I have with it. We can do it today, no big deal. I got it. And we can do it the right way. But this is what usually happens. Ain't nobody referencing nothing. They just stand up. Ain't nobody referencing nothing. Kind of like taking communion every Sunday. You know what happens? Boom. Psh, gone. Man, I don't know what that was. I don't know what that was. I don't know what that was. I, 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 churches do that. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful. If you don't, okay. But often as you do this, remember me, right? That's what he said, right? You want to do it every Sunday? I think it's great. I, I would do it every Sunday. It's fine with me. But for me and my house, I don't want to do that, but I'm going, I'm going to use it for what it's for. If we're going to stand up when the Word of God is open, we're going to stand up and give it reverence every single time. But usually, inevitably, what happens, because we're all us, we just do it, just be doing it. You know, It's just a mess. This is what people do. We just make a mess out of things. But this is where it started. If anybody wants to know, this is where it started. They all, and they opened, and they stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord. Now, you want to talk about a worship service. We're going to talk about a worship service here, okay? No smoke. No skinny jeans on the preacher. Okay? All right? No loud music. No, no, no jumping around. I'm going to show you a worship service. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, amen, amen. And lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads, 
and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Hmm. Does that sound like anything you've seen on YouTube? I doubt it. Anything you've seen in the multi-church? I doubt it. That's what happened. We take something so holy and we make it so wrong. Why? Because that's who we are. That's what we do. You know, give us an inch, we'll take a mile. That's what we're going to do with it. But you know what? Here's it. This is, you can't get no rawer than this. This is raw worship right here. He blessed the Lord. He, you know what he's doing? He's praying, giving God thanks. He's in, in adoration to God. And the people say, amen, amen. And they bowed their head. They raised their hands. You know why the Jews used to raise their hand? I heard this a long time ago. You know why they do this? Because when you raise it, you're being filled. You're receiving. You're, yeah. Oh, God. You see? And they're raising their hands and they're amen and, and, they're, and they're lifting their hands and they're bowed their heads and they worship the Lord with their faces to the ground, which tells them they just, I'm not even worthy. Can you, does that sound like an ACDC concert to you? And no skinny jeans to be seen. No smoke screens, no loud music, no people jumping off the stage. And you're like, I thought we was in church. No, I don't know what we're in. But this is worship. And I know somebody's going to make a comment. I'm going to get them. I know somebody's going to say, well, you worship your way. I worship mine. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to worship what they did, okay? I'm going to worship the Lord this way. Well, that's just how you worship. That, that'd be fine. You want to jump off a stage and do, you know, a mosh pit and all that stuff in your church? That's fine, Danny. But we're going to do it this way. We're going to do it this way, amen? This was what happened at the water gate. The people took it. Here's, here's something in verse 9 I want to see. Nehemiah, which is the Tershath, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and Levites that taught the people, said unto the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Amen. That little excerpt tells me something. They all wept when they heard the law being spoken. Why? I'm sure there's many reasons. But, I, but for this instant here in the context, I, I think I know why. Because it had been pre, don't do this, and this is what God has done, and all. You remember, it's laws, Moses' law. They ain't done nothing they're supposed to be doing. You know what they did? They got just told what they don't do. They just, they, you ever had conviction come and they, they start to bring the tears? Think about this. You know why? It ain't just tearing because you're tearing. You're tearing because you're heartbroken because you ain't been doing nothing you're supposed to be doing. Remember the mirror that I'm always talking about, personal mirror, that you're looking at yourself of God and, and, and you're looking at yourself? That brings the heartbreak. Because you know what God expects and know what he's done for you. And this is what you do. But this is what they told him. This day is holy unto the Lord your God. More not nor weep not. Hmm. Then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our God. Neither be there sorry for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way and eat and drink and send portions and try to try to uh, and, and make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Hmm. Wow. Look at verse 18. Also, day by day. From the first day unto the last, he read in the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the matter. Man, they had revival. Revival meeting done broke out this place. It was during the uh, feast of the trumpets. Yes, the last, towards the last feast. Yep. 
And if, if you read more in the chapter, it talks about they, well, actually the next chapter too, I think, talking about how they would set up booths and stuff, just like they did the Feast of the Booths from the, from the Old Testament and stuff. They were doing, they were going to go back to all that. They were getting back to where they lost it. They were getting back to where they, not lost it, just didn't do it. They were getting back to what they should have been doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Repenting. Why would he say this? Now, now listen to me. Why would the, the priest and, 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 and Nehemiah would come and the priest Ezra would come and all these ones and they said, hey, 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 this is holy. Don't be sorry no, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Um, uh, don't weep, don't mourn, don't weep. What is he doing? I thought that was part of repentance. You ever thought that maybe that repentance has already came? How long are you going to mourn? Think about this. How long are you going to mourn over that? If you've repented of it, how long are you going to hold it? You ever heard of forgiving yourself? Yeah. You know, I don't want to look back upon my sins all my life, but think about it up until I was saved. You know, all them's gone. Thank goodness they're gone still. But but if I if I stayed in in mourning over all my sins that I've repented of, I'd be 11 years in right now coming up here for long and wouldn't get nothing done. Why? Because I'm still in mourning from that. You know, when you bring it to God and God says, I've cast it as far as the east is to the west in the sea of forgiveness. Huh? If he says, I don't remember it no more, why are you? Amen? If I trust him enough in my life and eternity, i got to trust him today to know that he's forgiven me. For all. Right? I think that's why he comes up and says this. For all people wept when they had heard the Lord, the, the law. I, I got it. But you know, coming to the coming to, to the repentance is bringing the law and saying, here, we want God's way. We don't want ours no more. We want God's way. Bringing the book to Ezra is an act of, of, of uh, obedience and, and repentance, is it not? To say, give us this. To give up and to, to stand and worship the God uh, uh, of all. With their faces to the ground and asking and saying amen when they give them all the adoration to him. How long are we going to mourn over things that God says, not going to sin no more? I'm reminded of the scripture of the lady that was, that was uh, called an adultery. You remember this? Cast her down and Moses said to stone her, and they're like, yeah, okay, and Jesus says, all right, well, first one, you know, has no sin, cast the first stone. Nobody. Nobody. And he asked the woman, you know, where's your accuser? She said, I have none. Lord, I have none. And neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, I wish you could have caught that woman. Uh, maybe we could have had a little insert there. I, I wish we could have seen that woman the next day or so. I don't believe she's still sitting on the ground complaining about what she was caught in. If she did, she would have never done no good. I'm not saying I can always forget everything that I did because it breaks my heart. But I'll tell you what, that ain't going to hold me down no more. Because I'm going to be like this woman when Jesus says, Don't want to sin no more. Go and sin no more. I can't mourn over it no more. I don't like it. I hope that my testimony will help somebody. I'm not going to glorify them. And I surely don't want to revisit them. But I don't want them to hold me down no more neither. This day is holy unto the Lord. That's what he told them. Part of being set free. Absolutely. How free are you if it's still holding you to the ground? That's right. Most people can't do this because they can't lift all the sin with them. And all the mourning and all the memories and all that. You know, this is free to do. When you can do this, it's free. Why? Because he does it. Amen. He does it. He sets you free. Amen. Hmm. Just remember this. The setting of the word at the water gate. The washing of the word. <laughs> so what does it mean to be washed by the word? What, what does it mean? 
is when the word is brung to you, just like it was brung to Ezra, and, and, and he said, bring us the law. These people were washed by the word how? Because they, they, they seen what God required, what God has done, all the testimonies of God. Remember, Moses wrote all these. We've been going through these on Sunday school. All these things God's been doing. And they see what they've been doing. And it broke their heart. But you know what? It got them back where they needed to be. Going back through the things and says, okay, we're done with the old life. We don't want that no more, which is repentance. Turning to God and say, this is what we want. This is what we're going to do. And from this day forward, this is what we want. And we're focusing back on God. Worshiping to the word. Letting God come back with that, that, that huge love that he has and that mercy that he has. And when it comes to salvation with the blood that he shed, that washes us clean. And it's all because of the water gate. Amen? Amen. That's where we're going to stop at tonight.